It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Now, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting if you email me directly at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. If you go to our archives, you can find for free at Spreaker.com. Do a live show there Friday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. There's a chat room. You get an email notification when I put up new content. I play repeats, all the old, uh, what are the, the best of Opperman reports over there at Spreaker.com. And if you go there, you'll find our guest today, Ian Totten, who is the podcast host of the DeathCast podcast. Now, it's posted religiously at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every single Friday. It's not a minute late. You can catch it. You can set your clock to this podcast from now on every Friday morning. Wake up first thing before you make your coffee. You turn on the podcast. You wait for it to come on. Deathcast Podcast by Ian Totten. Oh, I've had him on three times before. Let me think of I remember. Jimmy Savile we talked about. We talked about um, the Roy Raiden assassination. And I can't remember. But Ian Totten, are you there? Yes, I am, and how are you? Real quick, before you remind the audience who Ian Totten is, what were the four shows we did together? We did Jimmy Savile. We did the... Uh, Roy Raiden. Uh, no, Roy Raiden we did on my show. Oh, okay. Uh, we did the Atlanta Child Murders was the first one. Really? and then we did, Yes, and then we did the Son of Sam. Son of Sam. Well, you can't beat Son yes. of Sam. <laughs> okay. Yep. Well, what a circus that's become now, man. Mm-hmm. Before we get into uh, the, the show today, is another classic, The West Memphis Three. Uh, remind the audience, though, who is Ian Totten? And tell us about your podcast, The Deathcast Podcast. Uh, Ian Totten is an author, uh, journalist, uh, part-time PI, general jack-of-all-trades. I kind of get into everything. Uh, the Deathcast is a extreme deep-dive podcast on true crime. Um, you know, I've been known to put out 14 episodes on a single case. That was specifically Jimmy Saville. Um, I cover every aspect of the case that's worth covering, whether it's so long as there's some evidence to suggest it or it's been, you know, a, a bone of contention within the case. I cover it. A uh, good example is the. Oklahoma City bombing. I think I did uh, 11 episodes on that. I covered every aspect that I could, even if I didn't believe it, because so many people talk about it. I want to be thorough, and I don't want anybody to say, hey, you left out this part. Yeah, I got a big show coming up, too, about OKC, uh, mm -hmm. another one I'm doing, uh, with a legendary uh, broadcaster. Now, oh, um, we're talking today, though about West Memphis 3 and off the air, you were telling me that you're already eight episodes deep into this topic? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I covered the case about two and a half years ago. It was a three-part series, and I got some names mixed up because I was still learning what I was doing. I had the information right, and but I used to also play music in the background and speak over it, and people... The show got so big from being on this show that people started emailing me and saying, can you get rid of the background music? Hmm. And I started getting a lot of emails saying, would you cover the West Memphis 3 again? You did a really good job last time, but there's so much that you didn't bite into and run with. We want to hear you talk about it. And I just, okay. So I started at the beginning. I think the... Eighth episode I started last night will come out in about four weeks, and I, I haven't even gotten to the trials yet. <laughs> okay, all right, great. There, so let's uh, let's start from the very very beginning. Why don't you tell the, the? I was just talking to somebody today, and I says I'm taping later on about the West Memphis Street. And she says, well, what's that? She had never heard of it. And I says, well, it was this occult murder, and a lot of people think they're innocent, and Johnny Depp is involved. You know, all this kind of crazy stuff. But tell the audience, what is that story about the West Memphis, Arkansas, and the, the murder, the cold-blooded, brutal murder of these poor little kids, the little eight-year-old boys? So on May 5th, 1993, three little boys, uh, Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, and Christopher Byers, they were out after school riding around on their bikes, and they disappeared. 
and nobody could find them. The parents ended up meeting up with each other throughout the night, and they just they kept looking for them. They couldn't find it, find the boys. And some of the parents were up all night looking, and the next day they're continuing with this search, and they went down into this area that's part of the Ten Mile Bayou, which is really a, you know a, a woodsy swampland, and. The police search and rescue were down there, and someone saw a shoe floating in this pool of water. And guy goes to try and grab it, and he falls into the water. And unfortunately, when he fell into the water, he dislodged something that was underneath that, and that was the body of one of the boys, which floated up to the surface. And over the course of roughly the next hour to three hours, they found the bodies of the other two boys. They had been tied right ankle to right wrist, left ankle to left left wrist. Their clothing was jammed down into the mud with sticks. Uh, they were all three of them were nude, and they had been savaged pretty brutally. And it was quickly discovered that whoever had done this had cleaned up the crime scene fairly extensively, washing off the banks of the this uh, swampy pit where the bodies had been uh, hidden. So uh, you can see it. HBO did a doc, bunch of documentaries on it. They're garbage, but the first one is important because it you actually have crime scene footage as well as testimony in court. Um, you can see where this is. It's kind of tucked in, in, out of the way in this lower middle class neighborhood between that and a major freeway. And obviously, this set off a chain of events that ended up leading to three young men being convicted of the crime based on circumstantial evidence and their own statements. You know, Ian, let me stop for a sec, because you mentioned the the HBO uh, TV shows, and you called them documentaries. Um, And they were in a documentary-type format, but the filmmakers really aren't any type of investigative reporters. They've never done any other documentaries. In fact, they've done films uh, after this. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think they even followed up on another documentary, just this topic here. so you really can't call them documentaries, you know, the beginning of reality TV in a way, you know? Yeah, and it, it was, and if you see interviews with uh, Bruce Byers. Sinoski, and I forget oh. the other guy's name, they they say that while they were making this film, they, they got the impression that the three young men who were under investigation on trial were – not guilty Mm -hmm. so they decided as opposed to documenting the facts and putting the facts out there for public consumption for people to make their own decision on it that they were going to present the case as they saw it and that is really what led to people like johnny depp and uh the guy that did lord of the rings and eddie vetter getting behind these three creeps yeah, man, putting up millions and millions and millions of dollars for their defense. Yes. Yeah, to the point where they were putting up billboards in town saying reward mm-hmm. <laughs> for yes. any information, you know? Oh, my goodness. And also, too, the, those hills where the, 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 the creek where the boys were found was called the Robin Hood Woods. Yes. Right across the street from where so-and-so used to live, right? Uh, that I can't. Re- oh, oh no, yeah, Eccles. Damian Eccles lived right across yeah, the street from me. Yeah, he lived in the Mayfair apartment. There you go, right? Yeah. Yes, when he was a young boy, and he tried. He told the police because uh, he was investigated fairly quickly as a one of many suspects, and that's one of the things that people get wrong about this case is they think that the police automatically zoomed in on Damian Eccles and jumped all over him and his friends because, you know, they were disadvantaged teens who wore black clothing and had long hair and listened to heavy metal music. Okay, it was 1993. Everybody had long hair. A lot of kids were listening to heavy metal music in West Memphis. And I say this because I've done extensive interviews with people that lived in the area including a few celebrities that told me, no, that entire story they're telling is fabricated. They, yeah, yeah, they, try, they try and portray it as the Bible belt where these kids yes. stuck out. But even Jesse Miskelly's father said, hey, hold on, all those kids down there look like that. Yes. Right, so, and they all did, man, come on. 
Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that you know the the supporters throw out there is that these kids were targeted because of this. They weren't targeted because of this. On the day the bodies were found, uh, Damien's parole officer uh, Jerry Driver, who had knew Damien quite well, he had extensive arrest history over the previous two years involving violence. He had involuntary commitments to uh, mental hospitals because of the things he was saying and doing, he looked at this and he said to another guy that was there, you know, this looks like it might have some occult themes and immediately started thinking of Damien Eccles because Damien would tell him things like, you know, he's into drinking blood and he and his girlfriend drink blood and he was in a, in a, a cult, and all of this stuff. It was one of those things. I personally believe that yes, he did believe these things, but I think Damien felt like such a worthless human being that he would tell anybody who would listen to these things in order to make himself appear bigger than he was. Yeah, and to, attract, to attract attention. That, yes. Because any attention is better than no attention. You, you know what, Ian? Your, your audio was really, really good when we started, but at the last few seconds, it's been okay. kind of you better. Is that better? Yes. There you go. Okay. There you go. What happened? Your arm got tired, right, from holding up the phone, right? Admit yes. it. Admit <laughs> it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. I know we got to plan ahead for that kind of thing, man. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, I, I believe that Damien actually uh, was his first girlfriend, Dina Holcomb. They were talking about that they wanted to have a, a baby, and they were going to sacrifice that baby if it was a male. That story has gone around. It has also gone around that this, it was actually the second girlfriend that he had who uh, was involved with that plot. That would be Dominique Tear. Right. She's the one that actually ended up having his son, Seth, uh, Dominique. But the whole Deanna Holcomb thing is what set these chain of events off. And that's something people don't realize Damien was a couple of years older than her, and because of the way he acted and the things that were being said around town with, about him, her parents informed her that she could no longer date him. Mm. And they made her break up with him, and the two of them, aided by Damien's mother, ended up with this plan of we're going to run away to California so we can, you know, have this magical love that we've got. Nobody can stop us. They ended up being found in a abandoned trailer inside one of the trailer parks in a closet, both of them naked from the waist down. They were both arrested, both sent to, for psychiatric evaluations, and Damien ended up getting charged with something along the line as a lewd conduct, uh, with a minor. Um, this is with Dina Hoko. Yes. Okay. So that's like the last time that he sees her for a while, but this started the chain of events of Damien Eccles getting into trouble with the law, Damien Eccles getting sent in for involuntary commitment to psych wards, and Damien Eccles really spiraling mentally uh, dropping out of high school, getting into fights with people. Uh, there's a story of him, you know, and he proudly talked about this at the time of the murders, trying to gouge another student's eyes out with his fingernails, which he kept filed to, I believe it was an inch and a half point on each finger. And trying to burn down the science lab in his class, all of that stuff started when her parents said that they could no longer be together. I think he was even attacking and threatening his own parents is how he wanted the boss in that psychiatric ward on another occasion, yes. perhaps. Yes, that was when they ended up, I believe it was in, it was either Washington or Oregon. Um, he went out there with them because his mother got divorced from Damien's stepfather over allegations that the stepfather was molesting Damien's sister. Mm. So they go out there, and as the story goes, there was a situation Damien's birth father really got into his face over the fact that he was threatening people in the house. He had a bunch of knives. He made Damien give him the knives. And then Damien is said to have said something to the effect of, I'm going to cut your heart out and eat it. And they decided that he needed to be institutionalized over this. This 
had one of those stories that his family has repeatedly changed over the years to say make it sound much less you know, egregious than it actually was. The original story was, you know, he was being a menace in the house and the family were feared for their safety. Well, they got sick of him taking all the black T-shirts. They, 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, it, you know, it was uh, upsetting the laundry room. Well, and, and he was in the, he was sit, hiding in the bedroom drinking. At this point, he was 17, 17 years old. The family is having all these issues going on. Well, how about now, this, too? He had a bunch of skulls. He had a bunch of dog yes. skulls and cat skulls, mice skulls all over his room. He was, he was hanging bones and skeletons on the, on the clothesline outside. Yes, and that feeds into stories that came out prior to the boy's arrest and afterwards that there was a – uh, a cult operating out of Lakeshore Trailer Park, which anybody doesn't know it, Lakeshore was and is, is still infested with carnival workers. Oh, really? And carnival workers are heavily into that type of thing. And there's there were stories because they asked a lot of questions of a lot of different people. And they started to get this image of this cult that was operating out of there that would hold, uh, you know – rituals in the woods and they would kill a dog and skin it and everybody had to eat a part of it and drink its blood and one of the individuals who came forward to talk to the police about Damien Eccles talked about him he, there's two different versions one he came and told them that he had just killed a dog that he had found that had been hit by a car so he could take its head and the other was in front of this person he stabbed this dog that had been hit um to watch it suffer before taking its head off, and that's where he got the dog skull that was in his room. Now, you, you'd think these fans or these supporters would just be upset by that alone. Uh, also, too, there's a great um, report, an interview of Dina Holcomb's new boyfriend or current boyfriend mm -hmm. at the time, where he talks about the Eccles doing all kind of ceremonies with wax candles and things. Uh, Dominique Tear uh, said herself, I drink blood. My family drinks blood. What's the big deal about that? She didn't even know there was something wrong with that. And her cousin, uh, TJ Tear, uh, yes. lived in Los Angeles at the time, <laughs> ran a magazine based on vampirism, and was the United States spokesperson for Transylvania vampirism. She was a yes. spokesperson for vampires in Transylvania. <laughs> okay. Yes, and they went out of their way to let everybody know this yeah. stuff. And that's it's one of those things that's infuriating to me because again, you get the supporters that they did. I had one person um, leave a review because uh, you know I got into things that don't matter on my on the show and mm. things that could easily be disproven. Well. The things that don't matter are these things that actually matter, which is the behavior of the suspects before the crimes, and the information that can be disproven is simply that they went and parroted back to me statements from the convicted killers themselves. You know what? Just recently, I was re-listening to an interview I did with a, a respected uh, pod. And I'm, I don't think he's a podcaster now, but a respected researcher, you know, on one of these uh, websites. I'm not going to say his name because. Um, and we were talking about something else, but this subject came up of West Memphis 3, and he kept calling them metalheads who didn't really know the occult. And I dismissed this as like, well, he just didn't look into it. You know, but but I, I look back now, man, and there's no way that you can't know all this by now, you know. Wasn't there something else, too, about Eccles? He was he was bothering some girls, little kids, 8, oh, 12 years. Oh, yes. At the yes. roller rink, right? At the roller rink, right? Well, there's numerous stories. It's after everything happens with Deanna Holcomb, and he comes back to West Memphis from being back with his parents in, I think it was Washington, uh, they decide it would be best if he goes back to West Memphis, despite the fact that part of his probation was that he was not allowed to return to West Memphis. So he goes back. He gets violated by his parole officer for coming back without written permission. And we start getting stories and police reports of an individual who strongly resembled Damien Eccles menacing young girls. In one, he showed up outside of a girl's home while it was raining and she was alone, and he started banging on the windows and screaming at her that he was going to kill her. In another, he showed up uh, – girls were playing outside their house, and we're talking young girls, five, six years old, 
And they went inside and got their mother and said, there's a guy outside. He's dressed all in black. He's hiding behind the bushes and he's playing with something in his pocket. Mm -hmm. The father goes out and attempts to confront this individual and he takes off. He makes a police report and later informs the police, the guy you just arrested is the guy we saw outside our house. Yeah, there was something else, too, with Damien Walker. He used to carry his briefcase around, and another time he was taking a picture of a little boy out in front of a house. And those are stories, unfortunately, we can't know for certain whether or not that is actual fact. But after they were arrested, it's they started getting more people to come forward and saying, you know, they, Damien had this briefcase. He was taking pictures of the of kids, and that ties in pretty well with uh Jesse Miss Kelly's very first confession where he stated to the police with no prompting that Damien and the rest of the cult had a briefcase and there was a gun inside of it and there were pictures of the three boys who went missing standing in front of a house. It has never materialized this briefcase, but it was going around there for quite a while. There was this briefcase police could not locate it and never have. So, oh, we're, we're, actually, we're running out of time. <laughs> we got about another thirty minutes left. There's no way we're going to cover the whole thing. Maybe we'll have to have no. you come back. Um, Certainly. You know, what about? You, you'd think that people would be satisfied that one of the three men convicted confessed to this on multiple occasions. Why don't you yes. get into the confessions? I remember I, I had a guest on once who was defending these kids, and I said, "Well, what about the confession?" And he goes, "Well, which one?" <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, first, before we look at the confession, we have to talk about this fact is they like to throw out that Jesse Miss Kelly has diminished mental capacity. However, in the years leading up to this crime, he was averaging between 81 and 85 on an IQ chart, and it was only after his lawyers told him that he needed to dumb it down that we started getting this magic number 71. Well, it, Ian Totten, I don't of, of the Deathcast podcast, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I have in my possession, in this envelope right here, um, mm -hmm. a, a photo, a screenshot, I'm going to send it to you because okay. uh, we're friends on Facebook. I'm going to yep. send it to you um, where – when Jesse Miscelli recently in his adult life just got arrested for driving without headlights on an unregistered, unlicensed car. Okay, on mm -hmm. on parole, but ah, let him go. Yep. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's a good guy. Let him go. His neighbor who went and bailed him out said to me, he's not stupid. He's a no. very smart man. Yes, and that is what everyone who knew Jesse said is – he might not have book smarts, but he's a very intelligent, mechanically inclined individual. So the police are – they had a woman named Victoria Hutchinson come in. She kept telling the police that she was doing her own investigation because her son knew the victims and that this investigation through Jesse Miss Kelly had led her to Damien Eccles, and Damien was a name that kept coming up. So on June 3rd, they – the police go to – the Miss Kelly house, they talk to Jesse's father, get his permission to bring Jesse in to talk with them. They bring him back to the police station, and Jesse just starts feeding them a bunch of lines, and they give him a polygraph examination. And when he they tell him that he fails the polygraph examination, which I should note, they got written permission from his father to administer. Mm. Jesse breaks down, and it's at this point – Roughly – they got him about 10 o'clock into the police station. Roughly between 1.50 or give or take and 2.30, Jesse Miss Kelly starts confessing. And what he confessed to initially was that Jason Baldwin had called him and said, we're going to go into West Memphis tonight to beat up some kids. You're coming with us. Mm -hmm. He readily agreed to it. Uh, they went to uh, Robin Hood Hills. They hung out there. And that Damien heard boys coming, told them to hide, and that he him, he being Damien called, got the boys to come over. And it was at this point that the three young killers jumped them. And Jesse said that he hit one of them, and he was kind of – the way he described it, he was saying that you know they were assaulting them. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, 
They were stabbing them. They were sexually assaulting them. But he didn't do any of that. He ran away. Well, finally, they got him to state that he was there until they had tied the boys up and that he believed the one boy was dead. The boy who they had castrated and who really they had molested the most. And he was never clear on the names of uh, buyers and one of the other ones. He kept mixing them up. However, the important thing to note from that is when describing the wounds inflicted, he was able to visually point to the picture of the child and say they did this, this, and this to him. They did this, this, and this to him, and I attack, I knocked this one down. That was enough for the police after multiple uh, conversations with Jesse to get warrants and to go out and arrest Eccles and Baldwin, who were both over at Eccles' house watching a movie because school had gotten out that day. I would back up a little bit and say that Jesse's first confession, I believe it was to his cousins oh. about the shoes. Oh, yeah, that was uh, – I can't remember his name off the top of my head. It was a friend of his, and he had been – the story first was that, you know, he had given these shoes to this kid. This kid was in hiding because he feared repercussions. Right. He initially, the kid said that Jay, Jesse just gave him these shoes because the police learned that he had given blood splattered Adidas to somebody. So the police go and question him and he's telling them this information. Well, they talk to him again and he's talking about how he went over to Jesse's house, see what was going on. And... He could tell that something was wrong with Jesse, and he said, what's the matter? And he said, those kids last night, we killed them. And he started explaining it without getting into detail, but he said, we got, you know, we did, we hurt somebody real bad. And he gave this kid the shoes because he couldn't stand to see them anymore. And the police learned this information right after Jesse um, was c confessed for the first time. So it wasn't like they, you know, they ran out to find somebody. This right. kid came into them. And, and also, that. too, Jesse's own father and his girlfriend said that Jesse was having night terrors and screaming in the middle of the yes. night. Yes. So, and that's on videotape. They show you that in a TV show. Yes. On HBO. So, you know, mm -hmm. can't deny that. Uh, yes. But but Jesse came up with a great alibi. He had, I think it was 90 friends from a wrestling match on a different night, but still he had them, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, that whole thing. And, and that, that's the funny thing is Jesse said, so he confesses, and the, on the 7th he write, writes a letter to his family saying, you know I wasn't there, I don't do anything crazy like this. But then he does another confession. Somewhere between July and August he gives another confession, which corroborated the first as he's telling his family that he wasn't involved. And there's even records from his lawyer, Stedman, stating uh, the question, why is Jesse telling his family he wasn't there and telling law enforcement he was? Yeah. And this is a pattern that we started to see with him where he's publicly stating that I wasn't there, I had nothing to do with it. I went to this wrestling match that actually took place the Wednesday beforehand, not the night of the murders. Uh, and he's confessing over and over and over again. And yeah. every time he confesses, he's getting a little more truthful and admitting that he was a little more involved than he said the first time. Yeah, then, of course, it was the confession with his hand on the Bible with his lawyer yes. present. Right? That was the that was after he was convicted on his way to jail he, or uh, to prison. He uh, confessed to the officers bringing him. His lawyer gets a phone call stating, hey, Jesse's confessing again. And the lawyer shows up and trying to get him to stop, he won't see. He has Jesse place his hand on a Bible, and that's when Jesse spills the beans on everything and admits that, hey, I was there. I was there from start to finish. Uh, I left when they were putting the bodies in the water. Uh, I beat the one kid so badly that he stopped moving. I witnessed everything that Jason and Damien did to these kids. And if you want proof, Vicki Hutchinson bought me a bottle of Evan Williams whiskey beforehand. I was drinking it on the way over, and I was so disgusted by this that after I left, I went to an underpass and I smashed the bottle. Mm. Stedman went there and found the shards of the bottle. 
You know, so yeah, not, not like stupid, I, okay, I kind, of, kind of understand at the time, I guess it was the mid-90s, people are watching yes. this HBO TV show and they say, oh, this guy had a 70 IQ. Oh, my goodness. I took advantage mm-hmm. of this poor boy confession. They, they sweat him out for 12 hours and they claim on the thing. It's only a couple hours. But now we have 48 hours. We have oh, confessions. You go on YouTube. They've got confessions galore. You can watch confessions all day long. You watch interrogations all day long. Half of these people, man, they, they they're not much brighter than Jesse, man. They're not much brighter than Jesse. And all those guys, their confessions aren't being uh, questioned whatsoever. Well, and that's part of the thing here is, you know, people, oh, they coerced him. They yeah. fed him information. It's like, have you never seen a confession? They repeatedly ask the same question over and over and over again in order to find out whether or not the information the person is telling them is truthful. Because if they start tripping up and giving you a different story, you know, this guy's hiding something. It's just basic interrogation technique, but they don't look at that. They look at the fact that it was, you know, these two snot-nosed kids and, you know, this dreamy 18-year-old that the women swoon over now. Now, uh, speaking of the dreamy 18-year-old, Eccles uh, also, he, before the, the, the crime, he said he wanted yes. to sacrifice a baby. Um, mm-hmm. When he was questioned by the police, I believe he failed a polygraph, right? And he said, I'll tell you everything when my mother comes. Yes, and the mother showed up, and afterwards he refused to speak. But Eccles damned himself almost as badly as Jesse Miss Kelly did because the police were talking to him, and the things that he was saying were things that only the killer would know. He explained to them that the they killed three of them, and because three is a magic number in the in the occult, and that whatever they did to these boys would come back to them positively threefold. He said that they, uh, you know, the, the the boys were probably sexually assaulted. One of them was probably savage, worse than the others, which was true. The killer probably enjoyed the fact that he had done this, but the really damning thing that he said, the officers asked them why they, he thinks the bodies were put in the water, and Damien said probably to get the urine out of their mouths. Mm. Well, the police had no idea of any idea thing having to do with urine, and it wasn't until later that they got the toxicology report back from the coroner's office that they learned that a substance that was very similar to urine was found in one of the boys' bodies. How would Damien Eccles know that particular detail unless he had urinated in the boys' bodies? I, I wasn't aware of that. Now, now what yes. about the, the confession in front of the quote-unquote softball girls? And that's another one that you know, they dispute, oh, he was just playing. Right. Damien was at a softball game, and there's a couple of different versions of that story. Some state that he was bragging to people that they had been involved in these murders and that he got into an argument with somebody and told them, you're next. You know what happened to those three boys? Well, we're going after three girls after this. The other version of the story is that he wasn't bragging, but he did let girls know at softball game and over at the concession stand in earshot of everybody and their mother that we're going to – we're next we're going after girls and you're the ones we're taking. And multiple people heard this and multiple people reported it to the police. But yeah, did you read those police reports? Yes, I have. Yeah, I think it's the most damning thing in the world because it wasn't just a, a, a minor incident. Like the, the place was in an uproar. Families were leaving. You know, this is a whole thing, you know? Yes, he made a, he made a massive scene yeah. about it. And, and, and he first claimed, well, they made it up to get attention for themselves. And then later on says, well, oh, I was joking. Okay. Yes. So now if you're – they knew those witnesses were coming in. So his lawyers sat down with him and went over that police statement, and they came up with the excuse, oh, they, they must be making it up. And then later on, he changes and says they're joking? Come on. Well, of course, it's, it's everything. And I'm sure he had some coaching by people working for Sanofsky and, his, and Berlinger because, you know, the whole – if you watch that first documentary, everything they do with him is real dramatic of him smoking the cigarette down to the nub and chewing on his fingernails um, to try and present him in the most you know, favorable light possible. However, when he actually goes to court, they cut out the testimony that he gave where he's talking about how he was in Aleister Crowley and into the occult and his friends would do this and blood drinking was part of that. They cut all that important stuff out and left in only bits and pieces of it because otherwise, you, you know, they couldn't have his testimony in the film. 
<laughs> you know, let me tell you something. I, I genuinely believe that this guy one day will come out and confess to these murders and say, listen, I did do it, and it did give me power. Look at yeah. the power I've gotten. I got all this money. I got all this fame. Yeah, I had to do a little time in the hole there, you know, but it, it worked. The yes. magic worked. I think he's going to say that. Um, that We have his, um, you know, we, get, we talked to that guy who uh, got his storage locker. You know? mm-hmm. Yes, I remember. Right, and I, we got the letters. And he mm-hmm. says in the letters, he wrote a letter to someone saying, I am the devil, not a devil, the devil. And if you don't believe me, you and I can sit down, go out to dinner, and I'll prove it to you. This guy's into some serious black magic, man, you know? Oh, yeah, that was to his wife. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. And, and also, too, uh, he talks he talks about uh, hog tying, you know, in these yes. letters, and also uh, uh, anal uh, animals yeah. and stuff like that, you know? Uh, yep. Yeah. So, But that's the thing. Well, he, all of this happened. Miss Kelly and Baldwin end up getting life sentences. De- Eccles is, get, ends up getting sentenced to death. Yeah. And the stories coming out were that, you know, he's dying on death row. All of this stuff, and I tell you, I was a believer in their innocence until I read his very first book. And I'm reading all of this stuff, and in this book he's talking about, I was never into black magic. I was never into magic, and I'm reading it, and I said to myself, you know what? Something's not right here because everything he's saying in here is in direct contradiction to what he, what he said on film. And that's when I found the Callahan site, which has all of the police reports and court documents related to this case. And I started looking into it for myself, and I said, you know what? These guys did it. You yeah, know, including the Exhibit over. 500, which is his psychiatric reports, too, yes. as well. And that is the most damning thing other than his statements to the police that Eccles had. Really, if you read into it, he was homicidal and suicidal, a schizophrenic. Now, I think one of the standard uh, the defenders, the supporters uh, uh, will come out with is um, that, well, then, Ian, and why did the prosecutor let them go? They, they, they were let go. They were set free. if They were proven innocent and set free from prison. That, that's just it. They were never proven innocent. They kept going with these appeals. And we've never seen it. They set, kept saying that they had DNA evidence that was going to exonerate them, yeah. and they wanted to do these tests. Apparently, they did the tests, but that DNA evidence never came around. So Jason Baldwin's lawyers were really hounding him of, look, we can get you guys an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea means that you get out of prison. You are still guilty, but you have the right to publicly proclaim your innocence. And if we don't do this thing, Damien's going to die on death row, and Jason wouldn't do it. And his lawyers and Damien's lawyers harped on him enough that he finally said, okay, we'll do it. I have to give Baldwin that much. He re- he didn't want to take it because his thought process was, I'm either going to be completely exonerated or I'm going to stay in here. And it was only because of pressure from outside forces that he agreed to do it, and the reason that the – the uh, state decided to do it was because they were sick and tired of dealing with them, their Hollywood friends, and the amount of money that was being poured into this thing. Unfortunately, the guy who had been handling the case prior to that, he I believe he got promoted, and it was somebody new came into the position of yeah. DA, and he decided, I just want this out of my hair. You yeah. know, he wanted to look good publicly, so he offered it, and they took it. <laughs> A lot of supporters will say, well, they never pled guilty. They took an Alfred plea. Yes. An Alfred plea they, is a guilty plea. Okay, you're yes. just saying that's okay. I'm, I'm uh, maintaining my innocence, uh, mm-hmm. but, but there's overwhelming evidence that I will be convicted in court so that I'm going to take this plea. I'm going to plead guilty but maintain my innocence. Yes. It's an Alfred plea. Now, the reason why more people don't take an Alfred plea um, before they get sentenced is because then the judge says, we're well, not showing remorse. And then when it's time for parole, you're never going to get parole if you keep, if you keep mm-hmm. saying you're innocent. <laughs> okay. Yes. Especially in a case like this with three little victims that have got family showing up with the parole here. Mm-hmm. So that's why that's why the Alfred plea is not all that common. This isn't a special thing that 
oh, they took the Alfred plea because they're innocent. Most people don't take the Alfred plea because they know it's going to screw them at sentencing and they know it's going to screw them up uh, in a parole board. But they, they had nothing to worry about. They'd serve their time. They'd serve the amount of time that a lot of guys serve for killing, for murder. You yes. Know? 18 years. And, that, and that's that's part of the thing that they that the supporters don't grasp is right. that they did plead guilty. Right. And the basically what it says is, we're going to, you know, you have the right to protest your innocence, but the state contends that they still have enough evidence to convict you if retried. I got to tell you something. I don't know how they got this parole deal, unsupervised parole, uh, where basically they're allowed to do whatever the hell they want now. You know, Damien is, is uh, hanging around with convicted felons, all kind of crazy people. And uh, that's the yeah. DA. That was the DA. That was part of it. He wanted yeah. them gone so badly and out of his hair. So again, he could look good to the voting public that he was willing to do anything short of proving them innocent to allow them out to get them out of the prison system and get the headache away from him. Uh, technically, Damien shouldn't have been allowed to leave the state. He didn't ask for permission, but he did. And they just let him go to Salem, Massachusetts, because, you know, he's not a witcher in the magic or anything. Yeah. He just happens to go to a place in American folklore that's associated with it. Um, they got, I believe they got a 10-year parole, and if they had any run-ins with the law or probation violations, they were to go back to, uh, to jail. And we already know Jesse Miss Kelly violated his parole numerous times constantly and they never did anything and i believe it's because of the political headache that it would cause for everyone involved yeah this has been a tragedy for everybody involved yes it, it, many of the the children's family members have their own problems with the law and stuff like that now mm -hmm. a, a lot of the supporters again will say uh ian totten death cast podcast host <laughs> <laughs> it's not these three innocent heavy metal uh, black shirt guys it's the stepdad but, oh, the, pro but the problem is the stepdad is interchangeable yes, <laughs> but well, you just say the stepdad is, then you're gonna say well which one but go ahead tell yeah. us about that okay so <laughs> it started with the second movie made in the uh paradise lost films where they were looking for alternative suspects well you have john mark byers who was just completely loony even when he wasn't on drugs or drinking, he was loony, and they paid him to act a certain way on camera. They gave him booze, and they videotaped all of this. There's a scene in the second film where he's burning stuff in the woods and screaming. So that's the yeah, they, you know, uh, According to Sean Wheeler, they actually gave him money to buy marijuana yes. and booze right before that scene. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and they, they admitted it. Yeah. And, you know, he's all messed up. He was messed up. He had a very hard life. He's dead now. Yeah. Um, so he's the first suspect, and people were all over him. And then they turned their attention on Terry Hobbs. I happen to know Terry Hobbs, and Terry Hobbs is not someone who would go out of his way to murder an individual. He's a very soft-spoken, nice guy. Um, yes, he did have a conviction for, I believe it was involuntary manslaughter of his brother-in-law, However, if you look at that particular case, it wasn't a situation where he just walked up and shot him. There was a violent altercation that led to that. Well, but also, too, Terry Hobbs, I don't think, could, could pull this off uh, and keep it quiet no. all these years. It's just impossible. It, you know. Well, the, you know, and they tried to say that What's there the motive? Was a, the motive? No, well, they tried to say yeah. that there was a gay sex orgy going on in the woods between Terry Hobbs, L.G. Hollingsworth, who was the fourth suspect in this case, who the police never stopped looking at, but he never was charged with anything, even up until his death. And uh, Terry Hobbs' friend who went out and helped him look that night, as well as a couple other individuals, they try and say that the boys encountered them uh, during a – an orgy in the woods, and that's what led to them murdering these three boys. The other story is that Terry Hobbs did it in between the times when he said he was out looking for the boys and hid their bodies in a manhole cover before going back, getting the bodies, and bringing them back and disposing of them in the water. There was never enough time for him to do that type of thing, whether he had accomplices or he was by himself. <laughs> 
You know, man, at that home, there we go. Oh, my God. This is bringing back flashbacks. Because another one of the theories was that the injuries to the boys' bodies were done by turtles, snapping turtles in the yes, water. Yes, and that is something, okay, the 10-mile bayou does have snapping turtles. But what they like, they they overlook is the fact that immediately after the bodies were removed from the water and the crime scene was secured, they drained that pit of water to see if there was anything else in there they found no snapping turtles nor did they find any evidence of snapping turtles having been in there and to further shatter that illusion all right this was a little muddy swampy ravine that didn't connect to any other bodies of water so the snapping turtles would have had to climb these muddy banks and trek miles to the next body of water You know, somebody would have encountered them because they went through this area with a fine tooth comb. Nobody encountered any sort of snapping turtles. Not only that, the wounds to the bodies forensically can be linked to a knife. They're not linked to snapping turtles. You know, also, too, uh, you know, take it for what you want, man, but right around the time that this whole big snapping turtle debate was going on, Damien Eccles goes out and get a, a matching tattoo with Johnny Depp of turtles. Yes. And, you know, that's... Yeah. Hollywood's Come on, man. Place. You know, I'm sure if anybody on the outside who didn't commit it knows it, it's one of his buddies in Hollywood, and it's some sick joke in between them, uh, because Damien Eccles likes to flaunt this in people's faces and laugh about it yeah. while winking at the camera. You know, I, I know people who have interviewed him. When you interview him, you're given a very specific set of questions you're allowed to ask. You're not allowed to dive in deep on him. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. There's no way to get an interview with him without going through that big PR company that he used to have. Yep. Uh, okay, uh, Ian Totten, we've got five minutes left. Um, I think we've just about covered up uh, a lot of this stuff here on uh, West Memphis 3. People can check out your series. You're only into eight episodes, eight hours, man. We can only do an hour. Uh, yep. what, what other? Uh, give us a real quick, though. What's going on with the Deathcast podcast? It's 7 a.m. every Friday morning. You can hear how good it is. Everybody should tune in. Mm-hmm. What other topics are you covering these days? Uh, right now, I'm, co- I'm focusing on that. Uh, I have a couple other cases that I'm looking into, a couple from China. A friend of mine's a Chinese teacher who's been getting me information I can't get in this country because they're so closed over there. Um, so I've got those coming up in the works. Uh, no, I, even though I covered it, I've had numerous fans ask me to recover the uh, Atlanta child murders, and I've even had family members – of victims reach out to me and ask me for the information I have on that case and to, for me to cover it again to get that information out there because my theory on it is the most plausible one that they have encountered because it doesn't involve the, you know, the Ku Klux Klan involved starting a race war. It's just based on the facts that were evident at the time of the murders. Then what's your, your conclusion on that? Uh, there was a child sexual abuse yeah. ring operating in Atlanta at that time. There were known members. One of them was Tom Terrell, who you can find footage of him. And many of the children would go to Tom's house and uh, have intercourse with him. There was also another individual who lived over near one of the swimming pools where boys – now, David Wilcoxon was his name – He was arrested numerous times, and the police went out of their way to state that when he was arrested and the pictures that he had inside of his house, they were only of white children. Hmm. The problem is that that's not the case because when the police actually looked at these, they found images of many of the boys who had gone missing or would go missing. But more than that, there were numerous witnesses who could place these children inside of his house at various points and the kicker is the everything with me ties back to wrestling somewhere or another all right the omni uh, sports complex in atlanta was a very big professional wrestling venue it was operated by a man by the name of ole anderson and the pernoter on record was a man by the name of jim barnett Jim Barnett during the 1960s ran a major promotion countrywide, and he had to leave the United States because he was implicated in a scandal 
where he was providing high school boys to sex parties for college football coaches. And it was such a big scandal, he ended up having to go to Australia. There's actually a book on out about that that talks about it. He, the Omni, was known to be a haven for pedophile men. And the police questioned Anderson and Jim Barnett uh, because Jim Barnett happened to resemble the individual seen in the back of the car on the night Timothy Hill went missing, putting what was described as mud on Timothy Hill's face. Barnett also was, or an individual rep- rep- who looked like him, was seen at other crime scenes during the course of the murders. And Jim Barnett was also very good friends with Jimmy Carter, who was president at the time, as well as many other highly powerful and influential people. The Barnett angle was quickly dropped, and they ended up turning their attention to Wayne Williams. Ian Ian Totten, we're going to have to have you come back and talk about the Atlanta child killings. I encourage you and the audience to go back into the archives and listen to the interviews I did with Cisco Street Love. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yesterday's Shame, who wrote the book Yesterday's Shame, who actually was in the mix with all those kids at that age Mm -hmm. in that town, and the, the group talk we had with Cynthia McKinney, the representative down there too as well, uh, pretty much dovetails with, with what you're telling us here today, but we are right. out of time. Ian mm-hmm. Totten, Deathcast podcast every Friday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, check it out and great content, man. All kind of great topics on there. Been talking about the West Memphis area, but also too, like the child murders, Jimmy Savile, all great stuff. Ian Totten, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ed. Good night, buddy. Yep.